All right, we're joined by our special guest, none other than uh, Twitter legend, seven times band, uh, the only other white dude named Mike we would allow on the show, uh, Mike Malloy, faded comedy legend. Mike, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on the show, man. Thanks for having me, fellas. Glad to be here. So we're you're we're we're pumping, we're plugging. Faded Comedy LA is returning July 9th yeah. uh, at, at the new spot on Melrose. Yep. Go to Faded Comedy. The tickets are probably gonna be sold out very quickly, but July 9th, and then they'll be back for their weekly show after that. Uh how happy are you to be back doing shit, dude? Dog, it's great. I've been stuck in the house for a year and a half just talking to myself, so I've got a lot to say, and uh, it, it, some of it's <laughs> been good. Uh, so, you know, I was figuring it out. I was in Denver this week because we just launched uh, Faded Denver there, uh, sold out. It was dope as hell. Got to do a couple shows in Denver. So I'm just kind of relearning how to do stand up, which is interesting, but it's like exciting again. You know, there was kind of towards the a certain point where you kind of like get burned out on it and you kind of like don't appreciate it as much as you should. And now I'm just like, Oh, this is fucking ridiculous that I get to do this, that I just get to like talk shit. It's fun. So Mike, man, you said you're getting back in the, in the groove of standup and I'm always interested in, in how certain comedians view standup. Like, like, you know, Chappelle has said that, that he wanted to, to get his rhythm back by like doing standups. Like, you know, we've all heard about the legendary Chappelle standups where he just pops up in some fucking club in Cleveland mm. and just, just rocks out for like three hours straight. Right. Like, and he kind yeah. of viewed that as like, you know, getting shots up in the gym as, as a basketball mm. player. So, so how do you approach standup and how has it been getting back into the groove of that? It's been tough getting back into a rhythm just because the shows have been so inconsistent as far as what I'm doing. I've only been back doing it like a month. So, you know, I've probably had like five or six shows, but, you know, some of them I'm doing 10 minutes, some of them I'm doing 40. So it's just, you know, finding that rhythm, chaining stuff together, testing new shit out. You know, Friday or Saturday was it I did. I had three shows Saturday night and, you know, in front of fresh audiences each time it was 10 minutes each time. So that was like you know, that was like doing each one was like a different rep. Like I got to mix in some different shit, try some different shit out and figure out what works, tweak stuff. But like by the time that third show came around, you know, obviously it's kind of a, a little different because the audience for a third show is usually maybe not as great as the second show. But, you know, by that third show, I was kind of like sharpening the tool and, and making sure it was uh, it was cutting. So. Is that the good. rule is that the later it is, the more an audience is just total fucking shit heap or what? <laughs> It depends. I mean, for the most part, uh, like, yeah. And it's crazy because Saturday we had, uh, there was a six o'clock, eight o'clock and 10 o'clock show. And there was a bachelorette party that showed up. And usually those are absolute nightmares at comedy shows because they <laughs> think that they are the comedy show. And luckily they were on their best behavior. They couldn't have been, they couldn't have been better, but it's also because they were probably the first stop of this bachelorette party and then they went and terrorized someone else. God bless them, not us. So <laughs> it, it was fine. And there was, I mean, every, everybody, especially Saturday, or, or actually, I mean, all the shows, everybody was super respectful. I think everybody's just kind of like appreciative about being back. And I don't think anybody's out by mistake right now. I think anybody that's like going out wants to be out and is like elated to be out. How does it feel like, to bomb a joke, like, or to bomb a set. Never like, happened, wouldn't know. No, of course. <laughs> never, <laughs> never happened. See, like, like no. coming <laughs> back from that has to be somewhat, I mean, is it difficult? Or, or is it just like, you know, just like missing, it's like Giannis airballing a free throw, like, fuck it, I get another one. So, you know yeah, I mean? it's same mentality. And, you know, before I, you know, I, I came from a sports background before doing stand up. So it was, you know, that closer mentality of just like, all right, you know, learn from the thing, but like, don't like let it hang over you because 90% of the shit's about confidence and just like acting like, you know what the fuck you're talking about. So if you can just do that and kind of like, I mean, obviously like there's, there's something to learn from every set and you know, eating shit. You can learn a lot from probably more than I'm, you know, many comics have said that you can learn a lot more from eating shit than you can from do, having a great set. But uh, I try to avoid it. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, I, I, I wanted to ask you, like, in my experience with stand-up comedians, they're never, you, no one's ever a stand-up comedian because they're like emotionally healthy, right? Like, there's like a, there's a, <laughs> it's never like everything's great. I'm super well adjusted, so this is what yeah. I want to like put myself through all the time. What was a year and a half of not being able to do it like? I mean, I mean, you you guys were a lot more responsible than other comics. 
And I appreciated that you didn't do, we're just doing Zoom stand up for a year and a half. You guys tried interesting yeah. shit like the drunk spelling bee. You did different stuff, but it's very yeah. different from being in front of a live audience. So just emotionally, what was that like? Well, a lot of it was just kind of staying sharp and like talking, like talking to another person, like, you know, instead of just putting around the house, talking to myself, saying things to myself, I'm bouncing something off another person. We have a chat that kind of gives me feedback on if what I'm saying is, is funny or not. So it's not like real time, like laughter, but like, I know if what I'm doing is entertaining sort of based on the results that we're getting. And, you know, I really liked, you know, yeah, like you mentioned, we pivoted right to, you know, at first we were doing the live streams with just comics talking shit. And then after a while, we were just like, all right, this isn't, I'm bored of this. I've talked to everybody who, what else do we want to do? And then we pivoted to the, you know, faded happy hour where we were having bartenders on and, you know, we knew how many bartenders were out of work. So we'd have them on and most of them were making, you know, hundred, 200 bucks just coming on the show and teaching us how to make drinks. So it was cool to just kind of like, keep that, keep that tool sharp and keep talking and, and, but also like not risking dying over this. None of this seems worth dying over. So I, I tried to not. There's a lot yeah. of people that before this shit started, were like, I'd die for this shit. And it's just like, well, then go ahead. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> you don't have, yeah, that works out. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like you have much. It sounds like, you know. <laughs> Everyone knows what they're willing to die for now. That's like a line yeah. everyone now has in their head. Like, am I willing to die to see my mom? Yes. Am I willing to die to go to a... Sh- no, no. I don't miss yeah. the movies that much. Like, <laughs> Yeah. And it's just like, you know, right when the shit happened, I know, you know, the tipping point, obviously, for us was the Gobert thing when they shut down the NBA. We were like, hey, we got to shut this down. Because earlier in the week, I know we had been talking to our venue and being like, hey, like, we're kind of worried about this. And they're like, Oh, I don't think you have to worry. And then the NBA shut down and we're like, we're worried. We're canceling the show uh, indefinitely. So that switch is impo- will be impossible to explain to people 30 years from now that it was like the dog. day before this started, everyone was like, no, that's not going to happen here though. And then it yeah. happened everywhere in a fucking day. Like, <laughs> And it was just like, all right, well, no gatherings over like, 200 people and we were like all right well our show seats 100 could we do and then as soon as as soon as the nba shut down or just like this is not responsible we'll just fucking we'll wait uh what what would what do you prefer with a set you said you did 10 minutes and you do like 40 minute sets you've been doing different like you know time slots what do you prefer the short joint or is a long one better because for me if i was on stage I would try to get up and run the fuck off that motherfucker as soon as possible. You know what I mean? So feedback comedy, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I get mean, the fuck out of there. Once I'm like in a rhythm, like once I've been back on my grind, I'm sure those longer sets will feel fucking fantastic. Like right before I, you know, right before the pandemic, I was doing, you know, close to 45 minutes to an hour sets at some places. And, you know, I have, hours and hours of material but it's really a matter of just like remembering sequencing what comes next what you know 90 percent of what you know 90 percent of the time i go up knowing what i'm going to do at the top and i know what i'm going to do at the end and the rest i sort of kind of feel out i have you know shit that i rotate in and out like of the 40 or you know the three shows that i did uh saturday the beginning and the end were the same but in the middle i tested out new stuff I, i sorted you know shuffled in new stuff see what stuff kind of goes together because it's kind of you know it's kind of like you know arranging a a musical piece you kind of want things to flow you kind of want there to be up and down you know you don't want to just just be all fucking rapid fire rapid fire you don't want to be all low energy exactly yeah 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 i like that analogy of a musical piece i haven't heard that before i mean people talk about like the narrative structure and shit like that but that's an interesting (laughs) point because it is like a different volume of like a different different jokes and different kinds of comedy, right? Yeah. I mean, it's probably, you know, similar to like arranging an album. You kind of want it to have, you know, a, a start and a finish and you want there to be, you know. It's, you don't want to put four slow songs in a row and then three really fast songs right, right after right, that. Yeah. Right, 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 right. You, you fucking people shit up with that, you know? You got to get, it's, a, it's about rhythm. It's about, you know, like I said, you know, having confidence up there and just kind of feeling shit out because you know what's going to work in front of one audience might not always work but like for the most part funny is going to be funny and if it's good enough it'll it'll work 
but then the ex- there's also some some people that just aren't gonna like it. So how's the experience of like testing that material out, like real time? Because if you're like a musical artist, you're in a, mm. a, a you know a room with a few people. If the shit's trash, they tell you it's trash, and those yeah. three people only people that know this trash. You know, what I mean, if you're in front of like 50 people trying to figure some shit out, that you know that that seems a little a little different. Yeah, I mean, it's obviously you know. You know, when you're making music, I'm sure you have a couple people that are, you're bouncing shit off of and making sure it works. But yeah, I mean, I guess you really don't know if it if it's good, good until people hear it. And it's kind of, you know, you, you do get that feedback, but you can't take all of it as as like gospel. You kind of got to just feel it out. And, you know, if something doesn't work once, it doesn't mean it'll never work. It just you're probably not doing it right. You can probably okay. find a way to do it. So it's just like. Like I said, you know, before you can learn a lot from those shitty sets, and more often than not, you do. Yeah, and, and and I'd imagine like Twitter is a great resource for figuring out what jokes stick, what jokes are does. Like, like have you ever utilized yeah. like the response that you gotten off of Twitter? Like, I didn't even really think this shit was funny, but motherfuckers are eating it up. Let me incorporate this, or or yeah, have you ever like been... look, on the other end throwing out some shit you knew was fire and it fell flat? Like, yeah, let me not put that in my routine. <laughs> Like, there's, de- there's definitely a lot of that. And there's, you know, a lot of what I do on stage is a lot of just telling stories. So, you know, most mm-hmm. of what I do on Twitter, besides, you know, being a terrorist and kicking <laughs> off <laughs> constantly, uh, is, is, you know, tell silly stories about shit that happened. And usually from telling those stories, I can gauge whether or not those stories are interesting or funny or worth telling in a bigger setting. So... Yeah, every once in a while, but I've you know I've, your boy's been off the off the Twitter for goddamn two I, months now. So I, I was I was gonna say I know Tyler wants to ask you about being from Boston, but while we're talking about Twitter, I wanted to say like I actually because you you you're on the faded account though, right? So you still yeah, see been, the people I've been that you around on there. So you still see <laughs> the people that you want to see, but I feel like to an extent you're doing Twitter correctly. Like you're only you're Kevin Durant with only a burner. Like you yeah. don't have like assholes up your butt in your mentions all the time because you have fifteen thousand followers. You're just back on like a much yeah. more low level, but having built the career off of Twitter, right? Is it was this by design or or how the fuck did this happen? No, I got in trouble again. <laughs> I didn't even do anything this time. Dog, they got me on some bullshit. They uh and like how many ugh. times is this that you've been kicked off Twitter? I've lost count. Some of the times I deserved it. This time I straight up didn't. All I did was ask a politician if she was a fucking idiot. And like that wasn't, it wasn't a threat. It was like a fair question, I thought. And they got me for that. And it's been, oh, it's been an absolute nightmare. I can't get it. Like we tried appealing it. Like I had my manager try reaching out. He hasn't been able to do shit with it. So if any of your listeners or viewers will, you know, if they, we, Twitter, we can't help you, dog. It's out. not that podcast. I apologize. Break, break me <laughs> somebody, somebody, None break, break the kid out. HQ. Yeah, dog. It's terrible. I might just have to start a new one, but I don't really like it there much anymore. Yeah, I, I can't imagine starting a new Twitter account if I got like banned permanently. If I got banned permanently, like, like I would probably be like texting yeah. John and Mike, like, "Hey, hey, tooth is out and say I said it." Well, <laughs> like just about once a week or some shit. I cannot see myself Straight building up. up another Twitter account if I got banned for real, bro. I think by your analogy of Twitter, it would be like if you were addicted to smoking and then you went on vacation to a place with no cigarettes for a week, and then when you came back, you'd probably be like. Let me just assume that was the universe telling me it's time. <laughs> yeah, right? I really right. wasn't getting a whole lot out of it. The only thing that kind of sucks is it like completely fucks my like booking. Like a lot of these clubs look at what you have as a social media presence and understandably so. And, you know, I'm going from having close to like 20,000 or whatever it was to fucking nothing to not, not even having an account. It's kind of like, oh, well, how are you going to fill a club? I, I get it, but like, ugh. I don't know. So you're from Boston. Mm-hmm. You're the only person on the internet who's from Boston that does not recklessly defend Boston <laughs> against any and all attacks. And I know Ty- that is literally Tyler's favorite thing about you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I was like, he's a Celtics fan who, who thinks a lot of Celtics fans are fucking idiots. And that's what I love about it. Because well, you know, I mean... 
And when so they are Boston's just, racist, you're the only Celtics fan who's not like, we're, everyone else is as racist as Boston is. <laughs> it's like, yeah. It's, yeah, every city's racist, sure. D- is Boston doing it still pretty frequently? Yeah. Is it something that they should maybe take a look at? Yeah. Should every other team do that too? Yeah, probably. It's just like, they can't take any fucking criticism. I like, I get it. You fucking don't want to do the work. It's fine. I, I fucking just shut up on Twitter. Then nobody wants to hear it. Yeah. Fucking Bro, big how did babies. You feel? How, did, how did you feel about the call to arms over the honor of lucky, the leprechaun mascot? During the I mean, incident? that is, I mean, Kyrie got exactly what he was looking for. Like, yeah, I mean, you can't, it's not like he did that by accident. He was trying to be a dickhead and he got a response. So they took the bait. They're idiots for taking the bait. They gave Kyrie exactly what he was looking for. People don't understand, like, that's the thing about these fucking dumbasses is they get worked so easily. And if you're, like, if you have just the, like, smallest amount of sense, you can get them riled up in the easiest ways. And it's just, they're dumb. And then, you know, people get duped by that Kevin, Danny Ainge article where he was like, oh, we're going to go fight Kyrie. People were like NBA writers the Tyler, were the like Tyler sharing Conway, that. The Tyler Conway, <laughs> very obvious fan fiction, like very obvious, fan so fiction. obvious, <laughs> like and talking about kissing like, players on the mouth and shit. <laughs> it's just do a fucking ounce of thinking before you react. It's not you don't like you don't have to be first to react. You can process something. You can look at it and go. Does this seem like a a, a real thing, a, a thing that I should react to? And a lot of them just go, yeah, absolutely. I got to do it right right away before anybody else. It's, it's, it's like you said, it's a work that they fell for because, of course, Kyrie was trying to be a dickhead, right? He was trying to be yeah. an asshole and rile people up. But now you're a 38-year-old grown man defending a cartoon leprechaun on the internet, right? Like Kyrie was an asshole. A sticker. You're an idiot. A sticker of a cartoon in the grand scheme of things, right? It's way better to be an asshole than an idiot. And it's uh, you're being a baby. It's a fucking decal. (laughs) It's a sticker. It's a fucking sticker on the floor. Shut the fuck up. (laughs) Jesus fucking Christ. These people, like, they'll find the dumbest shit to get upset over instead of, like, genuine shit to get upset over. There's enough real shit to be mad about. It's not on the fucking center of the TD Garden. It's not lucky. Well, lucky, well, lucky's well a problem, said. but racism. That's that's that. <laughs> let's that's do, something we don't need to talk about right, right now. But let's talk about God. lucky. But you step like, on lucky, I mean, you know what I mean? God, well, you, yeah, there. That's it's anti. It's anti Irish uh, hate crime. You know, <laughs> but on the left, God. All right, man. Our guy Mike, uh, as we said, faded comedy, uh, faded comedy, LA coming back July 9th. Go get your tickets now and uh, check out the show in Denver as well. But Mike, thank you. Good. Best of luck with Twitter. And uh, thank you. For, oh, well, I'm probably not coming back. I'll I'll do other stuff. And good for me you. On ins- check me and on Instagram, people. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on Instagram. I'm pe- posting pictures of my dogs and and when I'm doing <laughs> shows there. So it's much better. I don't. I barely share any opinions there. You'll love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Thanks for coming appreciate on. We appreciate you. you. All right, All right see you, fellas. Please.